I've got a long-standing interest in, I suppose you could say, the body in my work. And I've done a lot of projects that have been involved in some kind of search relative to the body. Um, the search for the soul, a rather elusive search, the search to go into some kind of interiority and kind of exposing the inside of the outside and the outside of the inside. And I think it led me to wanting to work with other organisms, other creatures, other life forms, and think about the translation of life worlds and different kinds of animal experience, if you like. The animal as subject, extending thoughts of the body beyond language, and looking at our close cousins in the world. Um, and animals are also, of course, endlessly fascinating for their, you could say, pure visuality. So, for example, I worked with an octopus in a film. And for me, an octopus is what you might call an exemplary visual animal. It's so extraordinary to, to witness, to be in the presence of. It wears its emotions on its outside, chameleon-like, responding uh, with its moods through colour and position, and in a way displays a kind of mutant form somehow. But these forms are very evocative and they're very expressive. So I think that um, once I turned to the animal, as it were, there was no turning back. <laughs> Um, I mean, I really had no idea what kind of agenda Antoine had. One can wonder and also access the, the news material, that the, the rather lamentable quality of news material that one accesses on the internet that's very cliched and very stere stereotypical in its representation in many regards. So actually when I met Antoine and listened to him, and in a sense he recollected not just the story, but also his own very philosophical take on his previous living circumstance, I was very surprised. Um, it, it, it was quite unexpected. People with their opinions say, okay, well, these animals should be in the wild, you know what I mean? Which is true, but you know, unfortunately, there's no real wild, you know what I'm saying? And the wild that we did have, that's why tigers are now critically endangered, because being in the wild, poaching, killing, you see what I'm saying? So that's a big contradiction. And also, if you can say that tiger need to be in the wild, then you have to say then we should go inside everybody's house. They should get rid of their fishes. They should take birds out of the cages. So, you know what I mean? I think, I hope that the film conveys a kind of, should we say another side to Antoine that I certainly, as a public and as a viewer, wasn't familiar with. So that's the first thing, that his complexity and his kind of philosophy of approach, whilst on the one hand you might support it and on the other hand you might think, what were you doing, um, is complex, so that's true. Um, but in terms of the cracks to escape, this was a wonderful kind of analogy that he draws out in the way he describes their living and the way he talks as you say, epiphany style, about a kind of aim to fulfilment in some way. And this seems to me to be almost a kind of Edenic fulfilment, a looking for a paradise, a kind of search with the animals towards some kind of better place. But in my view, uh, the thing that's most important about that um, is that is the verticality of the structure, of the block, of the apartment building itself that they lived in. 
Perhaps the cracks to escape are relative to the, to the fact of this verticality, this high-rise living, quite literally, um, and how, in a sense, you have the opportunity, when living that way, to embrace thought at different levels. So within the film he talks, for example, about um, uh, taking Ming as a cub to the roof and how that situation was for him a kind of perfect world, um, an ultimate moment, I believe he calls it. But yes, those cracks, they sort of operate on different levels and I'll draw, draw that out a little if I may. He, the cracks to escape appear through this kind of different set of heights, um, but they also appear maybe in the kind of fabric of the building, in the geometry of the building, in the, a lift shaft as a crack to escape, quite literally. And then also in the film they appear within his own body, Within, within his body language, as it were. So at the beginning of the film, the first thing we see is the cracking, oh, I've just done it, <laughs> of, of his um, knuckles. And right at the end of the film, when we finally see him, as it were, escaped from the vehicle that I contained him within to, to listen to his recollections, we also see him kind of exercising his body to kind of crack and move relative to that and um, so I think it operates on a number of levels but is a really interesting kind of um, provocation on his part for how thought can become manifest in some way. Yes I've, I've worked with Nancy on a number of projects now and um, first of all it's a great privilege to do so and in many ways what he produces for the projects is very unexpected. Um, so I offer him some ideas on how I'm proceeding, what's happening, uh, where the research is going. And then in a sense, again, he has a channel into the film with whatever material he provides. By your stretches, by your lips, by your sated sleep, by your starts, by your fury, your courage, your glory, which our tongues try to form in roughened rhymes. The Animals of Language um, is, for me, Nancy's exploration around the human naming of other species and how species are kind of operate under the sign of that name. But it's also a very playful um, text relative to that. So for example, the tiger and the alligator become the tigrator. So they're kind of combined forces merge these names into some hybrid mutation of the name. Um, but there's also a commentary for me embedded in the poem uh, and that, that is the commentary of one's proximity to these predators and maybe his own imaginings of uh, them living in this circumstance away from a kind of natural habitat, if, if one can call anything a natural habitat, um, and contained within this wild inside that we're dealing with in the apartment space. So he talks, for example, um, in, in kind of roughened rhymes um, of things like um, pure, cruel innocence. So this wonderful combination of, you know, the predatory instinct, but in the form of an innocent. Uh, and I think that combination is fascinating. Hilda Gudnadotir's rendition of it, her voicing of Nancy's poem, also offers a kind of, should we say, a sort of, almost like a lullaby approach to the delivery of that text. And I hope it's a kind of digression in the film that takes us to a very different 
plane of experiencing animal presence, animal time, and the progress of the animals through these various spaces, where they almost kind of effortlessly, um, shall we say, territorialize these empty, otherwise uninhabited um, corridors and, and rooms that of course I constructed for them. It's not a de-genred film, and I don't think it's a genre-busting film. It's not trying to break boundaries. I prefer the idea that it's not made relative to genre at all. I actually have no interest in genre. I'm much more interested in what, what you can bring to the screen. And if you bring that kind of questioning sense of inquiry, sometimes it means that the films and the work just open up. They're very open, they open up this space where actually you're left wondering, how does it fit? What, what is it? Is it, a, is it a documentary? Is it a philosophical work? And of course, it's neither all of those things nor any of them in, in many respects. So I hope, and it's an aim on my part, it, that the film, um, in a sense, defies um, the ability, its own ability or the ability of a film to fit.